So you mentioned the probability. Yeah. So then the question that can be raised is, is the probability is merely about the causation or the fault? Or, or the fault. Fault. Yeah. Well, uh, that it depends upon the, the rule uh, of liability. If it's a rule of strict liability, uh -huh. it, then uh, the only question is causation, but not fault. Uh -huh. Whereas if it's a rule of negligence, uh -huh. then there's a question of both causation and fault, uh -huh. right? Yep. Because if you're strictly li if you're strictly liable for uh -huh. the harms that you cause, then uh -huh. The plaintiff just has to prove that you caused it. Yeah, and, and the if, fault is irrelevant. And the fault is irrelevant. But if you're liable under a negligence rule, then the plaintiff has to prove that you caused it and that it was caused by your negligence. Mm -hmm. you, you were both a material cause and a cause in terms of uh, uh, your fault. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the uh, probability that you think about uh, in the I think that somehow in the tall case actually the cause the fault. Yeah. But how about is there some use the, about the uh, probability? Be because the, we think that the probability yeah. is a mechanism that uh, the people <coughs> develop to face uncertainty. Well, well, let, let me give you an actual example okay. of uh, probabilistic reasoning by the court that was mm -hmm. incorrect, mm -hmm. and it's a case that I know because I was on the jury. Okay, you know, in in America, in tort trials, we usually have a jury, mm -hmm. and um, if you're a citizen, uh, yep. you're re you're asked to serve on the jury every few years. Can you? You are expert. Yeah. Well, usually, um, I'm not allowed to serve because I know more than the other jurors, and they feel that it would I would have. You look like a witness expert. <laughs> yeah. You, I don't think you. <laughs> well, th in this case, you see. I expected that I would not be allowed to serve on the jury, and I'd plan my day, mm -hmm. my work accordingly. Mm -hmm. And then they put me on the jury. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was really surprised. Can you tell them that actually you are an expert? Uh, yeah, sure. I told them, but they put me on the jury anyway. Okay. What happened was this. I know it. I know what happened. What happened? Well, you see, to keep me off the jury, either the plaintiff's attorney or the defendant's attorney would have had to object it. Oh, use one quarter. Yes. I get uh, my well, guess, my guess. Yeah, you know you know a lot about this. Yes, so the way it works is they, the, each, each side can challenge a certain number of jurors without giving any reason. Okay. But if they have a legally recognized reason, they can challenge as many jurors as they want. Okay. So I thought I would be challenged for no reason, that's a peremptory challenge. Somebody would say, I just don't want it, mm -hmm. without giving a reason. And then I thought, if they didn't do that, they'd give a reason. Mm -hmm. He knows too much, it's going to influence the others. Mm -hmm. But neither of them objected. <laughs> so both, both the plaintiffs and the defendant's attorney were willing to see me, and I know why. Because they had interviewed me, and the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the plaintiff's attorney um, uh, thought, that, thought that I would give high damages. Okay, you looks like a punitive damage guy. Well, yeah, I look, no, it's because I think uh, in a lot of tort cases the damages are too low. Not punitive damage. You see, damage. that's the problem. Yeah. That you are not an ordinary person. That they already do some research about your academic. Yeah, well, they view. they knew this, but you see the see the plaintiff thought that if that he would win, and then I'd give a lot of damages, but the defendant thought that. I wouldn't let the plaintiff win. Yeah, I guess so. So, so, so each one thought, yeah, we'll keep him on the jury. One, one because I'm going to win, I'm going, and he'll give high damages. And the other is because okay. he's not going to let me. He's not going to let the plaintiff win. Okay. So, uh, it was an unusual event that I could be on the jury. Do you have any procedure that uh, um, the judge, if you tell the judge, can uh, do the judge have the authority or the power? To dismiss me? Yes. Well, I think, <clears throat> I'm not sure exactly what the rules of evidence say, mm -hmm. but the way it works is that the judge only mm -hmm. listens to what the attorneys say oh. when they interview me, when they question me. So you, you don't have the independent claim on this issue? Well, 
I don't know whether the judge could do something independently. The judges don't. The judges, as far as I know, the judges, the judges say whether the attorney's request should be granted or not. Mm -hmm. But the judges don't make a request themselves. See what I mean? Okay, I understand. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so <clears throat> this was the case. It was the case of a, a person who um, had a an operation for a, a hernia. You know what I mean by hernia? That's where mm -hmm. that's where the the wall of the um, intestine breaks, and uh, there's a kind of a bubble inside your your mm -hmm. body, and it has okay. to be put back. Okay. It's got to, got to be reinserted and sewn again. The intestine has to be, and mm -hmm. so it's a it's a minor operation, but it's a significant operation, mm -hmm. and this. Uh, man came into the hospital for a hernia operation mm -hmm. and he died, which should, should have never happened. He should have gone home that day, but he mm -hmm. died. And the claim was that the, the uh, d doctors were negligent in two ways. First of all, that they should have given him a, an exam mm -hmm. before the operation and having given him the examination before the operation, they should have decided not to operate on him. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Second, if they made a mistake, if they made that mistake, and they operated on him, then when the operation started to go wrong, mm -hmm. they should have done something different than what they did. They're sort of the duty of care. There, you mean? That's right. There are two 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 alleged breaches of the duty of care. Okay. One breach was duty of care with respect to the the pre-operation screening okay. of the patient, okay. and second, the duty of care with respect to the operation itself. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, if either, if the, mm -hmm. uh, if the doctors had been non-negligent in either way, mm -hmm. if they'd done the pre-operation -pre screening right, or mm -hmm. if they'd done the operation correctly, mm -hmm. he wouldn't have died. Okay. okay, so both of the alleged acts of negligence uh, were sufficient for the harm okay. to have taken place. Okay, what does that mean? Well, what that means is this. Suppose that the, the um, probability mm -hmm. that the doctors were negligent in this pre-operation screening was, say, 0 0.4. 0 0.4. Okay. Okay. And the, and the probability that the doctors were negligent in the operation itself was also 0 0.4. 0 0.4. Okay, so both of them are less than half, right? Yes. So if we look at each of the alleged acts of negligence ind independently, the, the preponderance of the evidence favors non, not okay. li no liability, right? Yep. But if we take the probability of 0.4 of one, plus the probability of 0.4 of the other, yep. it's more than a half. Yep. So if we look at, if we look at the whole, whole operation as a, yep. as a whole, the likelihood that... He get everything right is 0.6 multiplied by 0.6. It's very low. This yeah. 0.36. Exactly. And it's highly possible. You, you, you did the math right. Yep. So, so the correct way to state it in, in language would be this. Uh, if the plaintiff has to prove mm -hmm. the exact way in which mm -hmm. the doctor was negligent, then the plaintiff cannot satisfy the standard of the preponderance of the evidence. There should be okay. no liability. Okay. If the plaintiff doesn't have to prove the exact way in which he was negligent, mm -hmm. but only that the doctors were negligent in one way or the other, yep. then the plaintiff has met the standard of proof and should win. Do you try to tell this to other jury? No, no, that's what I tried to do. I tried. I, I realized. I realized this. Okay. No, the other jurors didn't realize this. I realized this, and so, so that's the problem because I I somehow <laughs> think the jury system is about <laughs> is against elite. I don't. Oh, yeah. I don't oh, think yeah. against, but yeah. that's the ordinary people judgment. But now you, <laughs> yeah. So here is a, another paradox. They you know that. As a jury, but actually you are from the law ex 
law economic that's expert. That's it. But if you don't tell them, it will seem to be... <laughs> no. Well, the, the, the interesting thing about it is that um, I asked the judge, yep. should we decide, do we have to decide that there was negligence in an exact way? Mm -hmm. Or can we decide whether there was negligence somewhere? Mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was, we don't know exactly where, but there was negligence somewhere. Mm -hmm. Which do we have to decide? Okay. And uh, the judge couldn't understand the question. Really? No, he couldn't understand the question. Now, here's the interesting thing. Neither could the attorneys. Because the, the plaintiff, the plaintiff's attorney should have said, oh, it's enough that you should find there was negligence in one way or another, even though you don't, don't know exactly which way. Mm -hmm. That's what the plaintiff's attorney should have said. Cause that would have, then he would have won. Okay. And the defense attorney should have said the opposite. The defense attorney should have said, no, you can't decide what, that there was negligence in some way or another. You've got to say exactly which way there was negligence. But I think if you go back to the reason of a natural person, yeah. that exactly the probability calculation tell the true story about the whole thing. Well, the the... If uh, if a if a person reasons correctly, mm -hmm. they would quickly understand the analysis that I gave, mm -hmm. but they still wouldn't know what the law requires. Okay. It's a, this is a legal question. The question is, what does the law require? Do you have to show the exact way that there was negligence? I think actually, this, 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 I, I suddenly come up in my mind that this case also let me raise another question. Very interesting. Yeah. We know that when we talk about the causation or the fault in a case yeah. that's somehow independent in each case you can see that it's the same yeah, right. that's, that's the right. problem that's so right. should we consider yeah. the exam before the operation and the thing the, the, the fault inside operation is separate or they are getting together as a whole thing that's right that's right that's what I was asking the judge to tell us what the law Require. requires us to do. Judge couldn't answer it because he, could, he, couldn't he couldn't understand probabilistic reasoning well enough okay. to understand my point, but neither could either of the attorneys. So n they gave me no answer at all. Actually, <laughs> the question is, if in the law way, I don't know, uh, maybe it, it works like this, that it should we consider it as a whole activity? Yes. That's it. If you you see, if you have if you have a whole activity with a number of parts, yep. then the question, and and in order to have the harm, you have to have fault in each of the parts. Yep, that's what you had to have here. You had to have fault mm -hmm. in the pre-operation screening and fault in the operation itself in order to get the mm -hmm. effect, which was that the guy died. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's the case, uh, then the jury should be instructed, I think, to find, to, to decide whether the preponderance of the evidence that there was fault in each of the parts mm -hmm. of, the, of the action had been met. Mm -hmm. I think that's, the rules of evidence should be written mm -hmm. to answer my question. Yep, but, but the, ju yeah. the judge, all the judge did, you know what the judge did, the, the rules of evidence mm -hmm. are written down, yep. you know, it's like a code. Okay. All he did was read me, read me what the rules of evidence said, but the rules of evidence didn't answer the question. Okay. That's. We understand this. We understand that very often the rules are not precise enough. They're not detailed enough, and you need a good judge. But because I would think, if you from the defendant's perspective, and the the attorney or the lawyer might just want to prove that actually that's the something in the whole. That's the whole activity that we should right. consider because the uh, pre-exam of the operation is actually is the part of the operation, and yes. then you can see the whole thing in yes. the probability that that's okay. Yes. 0.36 and uh, something like that. That's very low. That you didn't do it. Well, the in, the independence hypothesis could be could be quite important here. Yes. Because let me give you an example of where there is no independence. Yep. Suppose that what happened was this. Suppose the doctor made a mistake in the pre-operation screening and in the operation because he, he, he was uh, drunk. 
Yep. Suppose he performed the operation when he was drunk. Then his drunkenness would have caused him mm -hmm. to be negligent in both the pre-operation screening mm -hmm. and the operation itself. Yep. So that the negligence like of the one flag. is not independent of the negligence of the other because they have the same cause. Yep. On the other hand, if, if it's not that, if it's just a mistake in judgment, mm -hmm. you know, he, he, they could be quite independent of that. Maybe if he get drunk, that looks like a very clear signal, like a red flag, that the whole thing is wrong. That's right. Exactly. That's exactly and the point. So yeah. they just pay everything clear. That's, ex that's exactly right. I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't any evidence that he was drunk. I, it would be extremely unusual that a doctor would operate on anybody who was drunk. That a doctor who was drunk would operate on anybody. That, mm -hmm. You wouldn't expect that to ever happen. Yep. Didn't happen in this case. But nevertheless, it is an example. It shows how, it shows how different forms of negligence can be causally dependent rather than independent. Okay. So I remember like the Actually, this remind me think about the, what we actually talked six years ago. That wow, yeah, I, I remember. That's that. pretty good. <laughs> yeah, and this one when I mention something like this, then if you think the four is somehow independent, there is another thing to control it. Is we call the level of activity, right? Mm -hmm. So, and do you think this will apply to their theory? I don't think so because. But if you see the operation, of course the pre-examination is always there. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Oh, but maybe well, we need to tell our the, reader. Okay, okay. well, there, there is a distinction between the, the engaging in an activity and the care that you take when you engage in it. Mm -hmm. Right? So, this works very well with respect to driving. Okay. Because there's a question of how much you drive, mm -hmm. and there's a question of how carefully you drive. Mm -hmm. And the probability that you'll have an accident depends on both. Mm -hmm. If you don't drive at all, you're not gonna, your driving is not going to cause an accident. You're not, you're not doing it. Mm -hmm. The more you drive, the more likely mm -hmm. you, are, you are to be involved in an accident. Mm -hmm. And the less carefully you drive, the more recklessly you drive, the more likely you are to be in an accident. Mm -hmm. So with respect to driving, the uh, activity level, how much you drive, mm -hmm. and the care that you show when you drive, mm -hmm. how, much, how, how cautious you are, are independent uh, conceptually. That is to say, you can, you can drive a lot and be careful, or you can drive a little and mm -hmm. be not careful. Yep. These things are can be combined in different ways. Yep. I remember but, that, that six years ago that we somehow reached a conclusion like this, yeah. that we can see that um, there's fraud and the level of activity, but you can hardly use the whole tall lot to uh, give a solution to the two aspect of the problem. So exactly maybe right. you need another law like a tax law or something. That's exactly to right. Control the level of activity. That's what I remember. That's our exactly conclusion right. Six years ago. That's you remember it well. So the the problem is that when you have an automobile accident, the court will inquire into how carefully you drove, but not not how mm -hmm. frequently you drove. Okay. But the probability of an accident depends on both. But maybe the operation is quite different because the pre-exam is, I think that's not very independent from the operation itself. I, th I think that's right. The, I the idea is that uh, with respect to driving, we have a lot of discretion about how much we drive. Yep. You know, a lot, there's a lot of driving that we do that's optional. Yep. We didn't have to drive. We could have taken the bus. We could have taken the subway. Yep. We could have walked. We, we could have stayed home. Mm -hmm. But with respect to medicine, we don't... We don't think of most operations as being optional. Either you need the operation and you must have it, mm -hmm. or else you don't need the operation and you okay. shouldn't have it. So the activity level is not something that is independently varied, yep. or at least not as, it's not as, as optional mm -hmm. in medicine as it is in driving. Mm -hmm. And insofar as the question of whether you have the operation or not is, 
is uh, uh, determined by okay. medical necessity, mm -hmm. then there's no problem of uh, negligence or fault in, 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 in that matter. It's, it's only the negligence or fault only resides in, the, in your carrying out of the operation, not your deciding to have it.